Hello, this is Haku the Bean, and I am here with the final part of this book, Beasts of the Old Letters. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. This should be a really short video. Let's begin with the Zygarts. The Vula and Dwarves that live within the stream in caverns is miles from the ridge are known for their unmatched talent in metalworking and gem cutting. Indeed, the geothermal caves which they have made their home in are abundant with rare metals and gemstones, and accounts for nearly 40% of all jewelry trade through the fantastic lands. Any piece made by the Vula is a fine treasure to possess. During the mining in the steam caverns, the volume begins to notice that cards of gems would return to the surface with fewer stones than originally loaded. Though at first confused, they quickly found a creature mixed in with their gems that was indistinguishable from these stones except when it was feeding. The Zargards. Zargards start their lives looking similar to stones such as geodes or agates, with their eyes get covered in a sturdy shell that looks exactly like rock. Within the shell is a mishmash of tissue, organ, and organs. Zargars can spout small, over a towel, and skulls for locomotion. As they move a row of microscopic teeth scrape minerals and organic matter added from these seam covered floors and walls. As they grow older, Zargars begin into a bed and feeding on organic matter and turn solely to stones for food. But to the volants this may, gemstones are the Zargars' favorite treat. After ingesting the crystals, Zargots incorporate them into their outer shell, where they grow along with the rest of the creatures, as if they were part of the body itself. The older Zargoth grows, the deeper it tunnels into the earth to find more bountiful feasts of jewels. Eventually, they resemble giant slug-like creatures covered in countless crystal growths. Dozens of small, stubby legs carry the Zargoth's body as it skitters along the ground. Although at first considered a destructive pest to the gem trade, the Vulan have since been domesticating Zygarts as both a pet and a business helper. As it turns out, Zygarts shed crystals that grow too large. These discarded gems are collected and sold as they are, or further cut into a, an array of jewelry. Different Zygarts have different preferences of what jewelry they ingest, so the Vulan are sure to keep scouting for further varieties of Zygarts subspecies. During my last visit, I saw magnificent investments of ruby, opal, and even diamond zygarts in Volan's care. The good dwarf lair gave me a beautiful file over opal that had fallen off one of the creatures, which I now carry in my travel bag wherever I go. The Yanyar and the Yanyiros. There is a forested ring of islands east of the fantastic lens that has been left largely uncharted due to a species even the dragons and shared to hear mentioned the Yanyar. The Yanyar spread cold and lifelessness wherever they walk, launching everything around them as they continuously sap vitality. Anything living or inanimate that comes too close to the Yanyar will collapse, grayed and cold in a matter of seconds. Such behavior has caused the trees, the earth, and even the surrounding sea of their home to turn gray as dust. And so, the Yanyar's home is aptly known as the Monochrome Islands. Physically, the Yanyar are tall and lean like the elves, though they do not wear garments and like any parts of the identified gender, if they so have them. So, they don't have a gender, that's fine. Their skin is the same gray as everything they touch, and their hands and feet have long, nailless digits that constantly grip and ungrip with a chilling fluidity. However, the most distinctive and chilling aspect of the Yanyar are their faces. <sighs> a bulbous, smooth head, far too large for a body of their thinness, with squinted gray eyes that appear disturbingly human. While normally featureless apart from the eyes, the Yanyar's head will split vertically into thirds to reveal two separate jaws with even, needle-like teeth. During this time, one can see that the Yanyar's eyes are more akin to a tongue, a sensory organ attached to a fleshy stalk that runs all the way down its throat. 
It is believed the Yanyar are blind and rely on these eyes to smell their surroundings, like a serpent tasting the air. The first Yanyar ever seen in a shore on the beaches of the Fantastic Land 60 years ago. And it was uh, from this corpse's autopsy that most of the information about the species was obtained. It was easy to see where it had come from. Even in death, the Yanyar's his corpse left a, a trail of gray into the ocean, in the ocean waves. Though that trail was lost after the dragons pursued for dozens of miles off the shore. It, could, it would take another 20 years to find the monochrome islands, yet only 6 months for the Dragon Council to declare the area off-limits to all. Hmm. Most of the fantastic lands and evidence, so we believe the Yonder were too dangerous to go near, and left at that. I, however, know the deeper meaning behind the monochrome island being sealed from the world. At a different time, I would have probably been imprisoned, maybe even banished from your fantastic lands. However, now that my home is all but abandoned, I leave this information to whoever may stumble upon it. <sighs> the Yon Yard Corps are recovered from but as mutilated, with a huge circle or punctures throughout the body. Strangely, the wound had no exposed flesh. Instead, a black, empty void filled the gap. When the poor dragon doctor, Haridus, tried to examine the wounds, the void turned his flesh to pure black. He looked like a living shadow in his final moments. Then with a cry, Haridus faded out of existence. When the dragons finally discovered the monochrome islands, they found their, their explanation to the darkness seen on the first Yanyar's body. We need dark... Likewise, the Yanyar's helm lay the Yanyurus, an even more terrifying creature than the beings above. When the dragons observed, the Yanyurus appeared to be worshipped as a god by the Yanyar. The Yanyar will cast themselves off the sheer cliffs of the island to the sea below, where showery tentacles rise into thousands to spear the bottoms and drag them below. It's unknown how large the Yanyar is. Though its limbs are long enough to effortlessly scale 2,000 foot cliffs of the home, and on a much more powerful scale, capable of turning things to blackness and to nothing as seen with Herodus. The touch of Yanyar is persists at long after initial contact. This similarity has driven me to make a hypothesis <sighs> about the being's relationship. Being the Yanyar is gave the Yanyar with some of its power years and years ago in return for their servitude. A dozens of islands surrounding Yanyar's home show signs of ancient ruins. Could the Yanyar have conquered those neighboring lands and brought them to their master? It seems like a plausible explanation, no, since there has been no other life than the Yanyar and the Yanyar is, is as it's resorted to devouring its servants. The once much beneficial relationship has gr become grimly one-sided. And last, but certainly not least, the Zero Lasp. <sighs> in a fitting yet bitter sense, the Zero Lasp will be the last entry in the storybook, as they were the last creatures of the fantastic lands at the end of the war, and the first to die out in a new beginning. Other bodies resembled that of a swan, their skin was more attuned to that of the pearl crested dolphins that once swam in the iridescent seas to the south. Their eyes were of the deepest blue, their wings forever softly shining like fluid ivory, their mouth a smooth a toothless bill that curved ever slightly so upward. They were capable of taking a human form as well, resembling angels and a wing in all those suit they passed. As beautiful as they were intelligent, the Zero Alas were a vain and conceited race of creatures who forever squabbled of the dragons over whose wisdom and looks were superior, and so were disliked by a great number of the fantastic land's inhabitants, for whom the dragons were born leaders and advisors. As a result, the Zero Alas secluded themselves from all other beings for nearly a millennia, constructing a citadel of their own 
unto the live apart from those they deemed inferior. They ignored all pleas for help in times of calamity and rejected all offerings of friendship. It was not until the third awakening of the lightning struck Titan that, Zer that the Zero Last were seen again. Vamrov's storm returned with terrifying ferocity, and the Titan rose with its strength multiplied tenfold. Half of the Magician's Council perished in the ensuing fight with the beast, along with nearly a hundred dragons, a thousand birds, and a thousand more spirits. And still the Zero Last refused to act. And so the Maker himself came to the Zerolasp, his face dark with fury, his eyes only full of compassion, brimming with icy rage. He spurned their race, accused them of being petty cowards who watched their world burn around them. For their vanity, he cursed the sound, though, and chanted so that no Zerolasp could ever set foot in it again. They'd covered in the ash of those who was killed by the Titan as a reminder of the suffering the Zerolasp could have prevented. Overcome with despair of what they had lost and what they could have had, the Zero Last vowed to never turn their backs on the rest of the Fantastic Lands again and charge into the center of the Titan's path. Side by side with the dragons they once despised and the masters they adored, the Zero Last beat back the beast to its mountain once again. The, the Titan fell back into its slumber, with uh, the grief and devastation brought about lingered for decades to come. <sighs> the Zero Last worked with renewed with fervor to re in rebuilding it to make, make up for all the time they had shut themselves away. They became the chief architects of the Fantastic Lands and filled this world with their incredible and intricate handicraft. This lasts for another thousand years and life prospered. And then, less than three decades ago, the Great War began. And all the Zero Last had or, or ever would create was destroyed in the calamity that followed. Once again, the Maker came, but this time his eyes only held grief as he was forced to smite those he had fanned, who had fanned the flames of destruction. The Zero Last desperately tried to bring back peace, but to no avail. And so they fell into despair. When the last buildings finally crumbled, the Zero Last had turned back from had turned black from the ash and smoke. Their blue eyes turned bloody red from grief. As the surviving others fouled out of the fantastic lands, the Zero Last stayed behind, silent as the stones of their cities. And within the east ruins they remain, turned to stone as the sun sets for the final time, and the world turned cold. And that is the end of the Zero Last. And that is the end of this book. It started off really interesting, and then it got really, really sad. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. I'll see you tomorrow with some more content. Goodbye!